All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, December in Buffalo. I'm sure by the weather that I've seen on TV that uh, you, those of you in the uh, southern tier, um, some of the screens, looks like Cheryl's is covered in snow, so I would assume that she's uh, okay, but uh, I would assume that you in the southern tier are, are uh, kind of homebound today, so I'm glad you could join me, and uh, we'll go through some things. Uh, just a couple administrative things. Um, Several of you uh, have already turned in your uh, Do You Want to Work? If you are still interested, I need to know today. Um, you can just email me, uh, scan an email, or let me know what uh, the status would be for that. Um, I just need to know today because we're trying to set up the interviews. Um, as far as the final exam, <laughs> um, I realize as the weather just has deteriorated and it doesn't look much better this week that uh, we're going to have to figure out something for those of you down in the south about trying to travel up for the final. Um, I may create an option uh, for Friday. Um, I will let you know. I'm waiting to hear back on one thing that I have to be scheduled with through the corporate office that uh, I have to be at and I'm just trying to confirm the time. So once I know that time for that and where I need to be, um, we will try to do the final. Um, it's supposed to be an in-person final. Uh, what we may do is do it as a Zoom session, okay? Uh, what I mean by that is that I will have a Zoom so that I know who is taking the final at the time. I'll be able to see it logged in. Um, we will email you uh, the final itself. Uh, it is only a computer final. Um, it is not any uh, written finals, just one uh, problem in the computer. Um, so that will be the uh, option that we may have for some point on Friday. But like I said, I'm still waiting to hear, hopefully I hear today, as to what my commitment is on Friday. Um, I'm trying to move uh, some things around so that I can try to do it simultaneous with those that are trying to make it up here for the final in person at the corporate office. So that will be an option based on that, okay? That being said, for the final, all right, if you would like to grab a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, if you have one handy, Tim. Um, I will give you some insight as to the uh, items that will be uh, topics that you may want to have further knowledge or a little bit better understanding of with the final, okay? Um, topics for the final. Uh, number one is going to be a state tax liability. State tax liability, okay? Uh, topic number two, electronic payment. Electronic payment, okay? Uh, topic number three will be itemized deductions. So Schedule A, itemized deductions. All right. Um, next one will be health care. Uh, we're going to cover that today, but the next one will be health care. Okay. Um, kindergarten teacher. Kindergarten teacher on the final. Okay. Um, dependent tuition, dependent tuition, okay, so that will be one on there, all right, and next one will be self-employment, self-employment, okay, in parentheses behind that, I think it would be a good idea for you to put 1099 MISC or 1099 miscellaneous. And everybody's favorite, depreciation. Depreciation. Okay. Uh, next one will be rental property. Rental property. 
And also behind that one, I would put in parentheses depreciation. Okay, depreciation. All right. Uh, next topic, W-2 income. W-2 income. And parentheses behind that, I would put retirement plan. Retirement plan. Okay. Next topic is stock transaction or sale of stock. Okay. So sale of stock. All right. Okay. So those are the topics. Obviously, it's a little heavier on the items that we've covered since the midterm. Uh, the big area that you're going to want to focus on is um, how to handle those Schedule C's and Schedule E's. So Schedule C is self-employment, and Schedule E is rental property. So those are going to be obviously the biggest portion of the work, um, making sure that everything goes in there properly. Um, what I've seen from everybody sending in their problems, they've done a nice job with it. I know depreciation is tough. I'm going to talk on that just a little bit starting out. Um, so we'll, we'll cover just a little bit there. Um, and then um, we'll talk about health care and other taxes, okay? And then we'll talk about health care and other taxes. All right. Now, what we're going to do to talk about some of the depreciation. I know there's a, a speech up on depreciation on the website. Um, we've talked about it to this point. We've talked about it mainly just as an expense. Um, you know, it's a, a line item on the Schedule C and Schedule E that is basically just an expense, okay? But the problem in five and problem in, for chapter five and chapter six, there was some depreciation on there. And uh, we're gonna use that problem. So give me just a second here. I'm gonna bring that problem up. Okay, so we're going to take a look. This is the one with Barbara Young. Okay, so this, uh, like I said, this is the problem with Barbara Young. Uh, she was self-employed. Um, on the return, uh, she was self-employed. She's head of household with her daughter, Heather. Okay. All right, and they lived in New York all year long. If you remember on there, they had, uh, she had a little bit of dividend income, some capital gains there um, that she had uh, from the sale of some stock, okay? But the big thing that she had was um, business income or Schedule C. So we're gonna use that uh, from her cosmetic sale business to talk about her depreciation, okay? Um, you can see everything is entered there as far as her gross receipts or sales or income, cost of goods sold, all the other things, okay? All right. But as you can see here on line 13, she had depreciation. And we're going to talk a little bit about section 179 and the special depreciation, okay? I realize depreciation is one of those topics that is very difficult. It's a fancy word for expense, okay? With depreciation, what we do is we take and we look at the options we have of when to use that expense of depreciating an item that is a capitalized item. What I mean by capitalized item, 
is that it is something that is useful for a year or more and that we want to spread the use or the expense of it over the life of it, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that, all right? If you remember, we go to line 13. We're going to go into our line. We're going to hit F9. It takes us into a menu. We're going to start with a depreciation and amortization worksheet or form 4562. Once we open that, we have that, and we're going to use line six, description of property. Obviously, we have some great instructions there. It says accurate computation, which to me sounds like a good idea, and it says F9 for a worksheet. It's going to take us into an asset worksheet, in this case, for Barbara, and for her office, she purchased a multifunction device, okay? If you remember, this is the part from Chapter 6, where it talked about her buying a printer, copier, scanner, better known in the archaic terms of the IRS as a data handling equipment, okay? So we're always going to pick the asset type first. That asset type is going to help us get the determination of its useful life. We know that when we go on there, it has a little pull-down menu that has all the different options, okay? Um, trust me, there's a lot in there about the farm. You're not going to ever have to do a farm in your first year. Um, I have four or five that I do. It's, it's not bad, but you, you know, that's something that we teach in the advanced classes a little bit more about the farms, okay? But in this case, we're choosing data handling equipment. Okay, we place it in service. Uh, they said that she bought it on, uh, let's see here. Well, they changed in a different year. So, but this case, it would have been April 14th of the tax year. All right, so I put it in there in use in the year, okay. Um, when we come down below, we have our cost, okay? One adjustment we're going to make that I left here is it talks about the fact that she plans to use it 90% of the time for business. So you can see on line 1C, it talks about business use. So here where we have an entry, we can put in 90%. That's where we would put in the 50% if we were doing a rental property that's a duplex that we live in half, okay? All right. Uh, we have our method. We're always going to use the makers, okay? So we're always going to use that makers. We have the recovery period of five years. Again, that came from our asset selection up at the top, okay? So we know that that is there. And that also gives us our convention of half year, okay? Now, as far as the convention, Everybody always asks, how do I pick half year, mid month, mid quarter? What do I know to do? Okay. If anything is purchased other than the last three months of the year, it is a half year. Okay. Now, if I purchase more than one item in a year and 40%, more than 40% of that total amount of um, purchases of assets to be depreciated is in the months of October, November, or December. So basically the last quarter, then I use mid-quarter, okay? So if I purchase $1,000 worth of items and $700 is in the last three months, I use mid-quarter on my convention, okay? As far as mid-month, um, Mid-month is the one that's always used for anything that has to do with rental property, okay? So half year, if it's purchased in the first nine months of the year, okay? If it's purchased in the last three months of the year, mid-quarter, or if what I totally purchased for the whole year, more than 40% of that money spent was spent in the last three months, it is mid-quarter, okay? All right, so that's the way those work out. Um, as you can see here, I have my basis for depreciation. It's 90%. That's on line two because it's 90% of what I spent. I got my five years, and it did my current depreciation, 
and it does next year's depreciation, okay? Now, some items that are purchased can be, all right, special depreciation allowance, okay? So, we have three ways that we can depreciate an item. If it's eligible for a Section 179 or special depreciation allowance, it allows us to take more of the expense or depreciation in the first year, okay? In this case, this does not qualify, all right, for special depreciation. If it did, I could take 50% of what I spent plus the first year's depreciation in the first year, okay? So in this case, our item is $1,699, all right? I could take half of that, all right? So roughly about $850 plus the remaining $850 depreciated and add those two together and take it in the first year. So an advantage of this is if it was the case that this for Barbara Young could be depreciated on a special depreciation allowance, it would allow me to put more expense in that first year where she had more income, okay? The next option is a section 179. This one is eligible for that, okay? If she decided that the item that she can depreciate or should depreciate, she wants to take the entire amount as an expense in the first year, she can do a section 179. So you see down at the bottom, it says section 179. This item is eligible. Line five, I can put in there how much I'd like to take. All right, so if it's the case, my amount of section 179 is 1529. That's my basis, okay? So, all right, so we have that, okay? So, on that, I can take $1,529, and as you can see, it wiped out my current depreciation, but if I go back to my Schedule C, I took the entire amount as an expense in the first year. So basically, I depreciated it in one year, okay? So what that allows us to do it allows us to decide when we want to expense our depreci depreciable item, okay? Now, 179 allows us to take as much as we'd like. So I could take 1,000, all right? And once I do that, okay, I will take $1,000. It leaves me 529, you can see up here, left over and I get to depreciate the remaining amount at 106. So I get the, the, ad, the sum of the two, 1106, okay? Like I said, depreciation, basically what it's allowing you to do is something you purchased for your business, when do you want to expense it? First year, over the life, first year plus a few years, okay? It just allows you to get that expense in the years that you have income, okay? So that's, the depreciation things I want to cover, okay? All right, and do we have any questions? I'm gonna unmute everybody, so fire away if you have any questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. Tim, I missed the first part about when the final was, my I was out of the realm. Uh, what we're going to do with the final, like I said, uh, if you're able to make it to the office, we like to do the final in person, okay? Um, so if you can make it to the corporate office, I know a few have responded to me um, as far as times that they can make it in. I have something that I've been scheduled for now on Friday. Um, so it was supposed to be on Saturday afternoon, but it got moved to Friday. What I may do, I know with the weather deteriorating in the southern tier, um, A, you don't want to drive up here, and B, I don't want to drive down there um, and be stranded. I'd love to come see you all and spend uh, you know, a day in the snow, um, but what we may do is we may do something on Friday 
Um, I'm waiting to see what I'm going to finalize on my schedule. And we may do a final that will be similar to what we do right here. Um, I would give you a Zoom code. You'd sign in. Um, then I would email you the final, and you would do the final you know, on the computer with the uh, live. Okay? That way we don't have to worry about some of you driving up from the southern tier. Okay? Um, obviously, I don't want you to have to if the weather's bad. I'm trying to watch the forecast, and it doesn't look real good. Uh, for next the end of next week or end of this week, so we'll try to do that. So okay, I work until five thirty. When is this Zoom class? We're probably going to do it at night. Okay. The yeah. uh, reason I'm moving stuff around my other finals uh, for my other two classes that I teach, um, I may be doing one on Friday night. Um, so I may set something up for Friday night. But like I said, I'm waiting to hear back on uh, if I'm going to be available because there's something that may be switched for me. Um, here in the corporate office on Friday, so I will let you know. Okay, that would be okay. awesome if you could. Yeah, I'm sure. I, like I said, you know, I'm looking at Cheryl's thing, and it looks like she's smelling <laughs> the white screen. So, all right. I haven't had a shower yet this morning, so I didn't want to scare anybody. <laughs> I, I figured it was snow piled up on your computer. So, all right. yeah, it's close. I got about two foot out front. Okay. All right. Yeah, that that would work good for me too, Tim. This is Liz. Sorry, I was so late. I forgot it was Saturday. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. Well, yeah, like I said, yeah, I'm, I I'm just about to try to ten inches I, I, in I, my I driveway. from everybody, and I know it's tough. Um, but it's just the final. We like to do it where we can kind of see you working and doing stuff. And two, as you're doing the final, then I'm available too because uh, we'll be on Zoom and you can ask me questions and stuff just as if you were doing a return in the office. Okay. Uh, all right. Tim, all right. Tim, I have so, Couple questions. Um, for those who did who can come to the corporate office who signed up for Friday, when will they know for sure uh, if that's going to work or not? During the day, Friday we're fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so, fine. That's fine. The, the during the day on Friday is good. Okay. And okay. Saturday morning is still good. What I'm okay. saying is I'm trying to find out a time on Friday so that uh, I can try to do a Zoom session as the mm -hmm. final for everybody that doesn't want to come up. So. Okay. okay. And I have a question. Can you, um, that section 179 on the, on um, what we just discussed, you have to have, is it connected to the special dis depreciation allowance question or is it separate? No, it's separate. Okay. Basically, and you can take it if you want it. Yep. Yeah, basically, you start, okay, you got three options. You can start <laughs> with the section 179 and take it all. Okay, if it's eligible, then you go and see if you want to do the special depreciation where you take 50% plus the depreciation of the remaining amount. And then your third option is you just do traditional depreciation. Okay, so that's kind of your pecking order. And it, and it really does be dependent on what it qualifies for. Um, you know, in the book, it talks about, you know, what items qualify for special, what qualifies for section 179. Um, the nice thing about the software on the asset worksheet is it knows from the asset type and uh, the useful life that you use that uh, it'll say whether it's eligible or not and give you the options to select it. But like I said, the big thing is you want to take and evaluate on a basis of when do I want to use that against my income in my business. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, they seem like they're tied together, uh, but they're not. Um, you know, you can't use them both because basically you'd just be doing a 179 then because you'd wipe out the whole depreciation amount. Okay. Okay. So, but like I said, depreciation, it's hard to learn and even harder to teach because I can tell you nine rules and then I'm going to tell you the 10th rule to say, forget the first nine. Okay. <laughs> One of those things. So I just want you to have the sense that it is an expense. You put it on as a line item on your uh, Schedule E's, your Schedule C's as an expense, but you use the different sets of circumstances to say, how much am I going to take it and when am I going to take it? Okay? Because instead of being like all the other ones where it's a cash basis that you take it in the year, you have an option to be able to spread it over several years. Thank you. Okay? All right. I'm going to mute everybody. Okay? And the next topic, is everybody ready for it? Healthcare. 
okay? When the Affordable Care Act was passed, all right, this is chapter 15, and uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, in the infamous words of Senator Nancy Pelosi, it's 982 pages of the most incredible legislation ever created. We need to pass it, and then we can read it and find out what's in it, okay? That being said, I'm not going to ask you to read 982 pages of federal legislation, all right? I'm going to do a quick summary of everything on it, all right? So what I'm going to do, give me one second here. I'm going to bring up chapter 15 on the screen, and I'm just going to go through things here. So I got it there. Okay, give me one second. Nope, wrong one. Hold on. Here we go. All right, chapter 15, healthcare. All right, everybody see it okay? Type a message if you can't, okay? All right, healthcare. Basically what happened is when they passed this law, it said that everybody in the United States has to find health care in one way or form or another, and they have to have that and meet a minimum standard or they're going to pay a penalty. And if they can't afford it, the government has options to help you pay for it, okay? So that's kind of what all the topics are, all right? Now, health care, the one thing I want to remind everybody is that anything that comes up as far as health care that deals with your tax return or credits is only for those that went into the marketplace, okay? So if you're in the marketplace and you are eligible for a credit to help you pay for your, ta or your health insurance, that is where that would be on your tax return. Equally, the only people that are eligible for the credit must enroll through a marketplace, whether the state or the federal. For New York, we have a state one uh, marketplace, okay? Healthcare is basically broken down into about three categories, okay? What I mean by that is the first thing is you must meet minimum essential coverage. If you don't have it, you're gonna need to have an exemption so that you don't pay what is called the politically correct term shared responsibility payment, which is basically the nice name for a tax penalty, okay? And the third thing is if you get a credit, it has to be reconciled on your tax return to make sure you got the correct amount, okay? Health insurance and the penalty is based on your tax family. It does not mean who lives under your roof. It is based on your tax family on your tax return. So if I have myself, my wife, and my daughter on my tax return, and I have my 24-year-old son, his wife, and son living with us, I am not responsible for the penalty or providing health insurance or reconciling any credit for my wife or excuse me, my son, his wife, and child. They are not on my tax return. So all this is based on your tax family, not who lives under the roof of your house, okay? Minimum essential coverage. To meet minimum essential coverage, you must have insurance that covers basically hospitalization. Best example, if you have Part A of Medicare, you meet minimum essential coverage, okay? because Part A is the hospitalization component, all right? Here's all the different things. There's a little table that talks about all of them, okay? Um, you know, the other ones are things that you would have for your employer, things that if you have coverage from a foreign government, say that you're a Canadian citizen living in the United States and you're still covered by the Canadian health plan, the universal plan, or if you have military TRICARE, um, there's a bunch of different categories, but like I said, the big thing that has to meet minimum essential coverage it has to cover hospitalization, okay? 
if you do not have health insurance, you can get an exemption from having to pay the penalty or share responsibility penalty, okay? You get that in three manners. You get it for a hardship granted by the marketplace. Another one is through the marketplace uh, is um, creating a case that you do not require because of religious beliefs or you're an American Indian or any other category that you know uh, because of your religious beliefs, whatever it may be, um, that you do not plan to have insurance for the upcoming year. Or at the end of the year, you can file a form that is for hardships. You had a foreclosure, you lost your job, you're in bankruptcy. Um, believe it or not, if you had a shutoff notice for your utilities, okay, you had to take time off to take care of a sick relative, all right? There's 13 different categories, and believe it or not, the 14th is where you get to make up your own. It says any other hardship that did not allow you to get insurance and please provide support, okay? Obviously, one that's in there is affordability, all right? The insurance that you would be eligible to purchase, this is after your subsidy of credit, that you would be eligible to purchase if it is greater than 8.05% of your income, okay, then it's considered unaffordable and you would be able to exempt from the penalty, all right? You can do an exemption on the tax return. We're going to talk about that. And the other one is if your family's filing, uh, your family's adjusted gross income is below the filing threshold. Remember back from our early chapters when we covered who needs to file returns, we had the filing thresholds, okay? So we have that within there. You can see all the different exemptions here, okay? Income below the filing threshold, unaffordable. If you're transitioning between jobs, sometimes you have to wait 60 to 90 days before your new employer would provide insurance, kind of a, a holding period or waiting period. You can have an exemption and not pay the penalty, okay? As I talked about, if you are a member of a healthcare sharing ministry, what that is, you hear about them on the radio at times, they're kind of like co-ops. Everybody puts into the kitty, you have a claim, you pay it, take the bill to the, uh, sharing uh, care, healthcare sharing ministry and they pay it okay Indians um, incarcerated all right believe it or not as a navigator for the healthcare law I spent three hours having to be recertified and trained to help people that are incarcerated all right get insurance but if you're incarcerated you can also opt out um, you can see some of the other ones there is one here members of certain religious sects you know, we'll talk about that, how to apply for that, okay? General hardships, as I said, again, there's a form for that, and you can see all the different things, <coughs> excuse me, that would allow you not to pay. The share responsibility, that is basically the tax penalty for not having health insurance, okay? On that, you can see here, the share of responsibility for 2015 was 2% of the household income or 325 per an adult, 162.50 per a dependent with a maximum of 975. This year for 2016 returns, that is 2.5%, 675 with a maximum of $2,085 for those not having insurance. There's a refresher on that withholding, or excuse me, the filing thresholds. Uh, for those that uh, would opt, would not have to pay the penalty if their household is below the filing threshold, okay? To prove that you have health insurance, you probably started to receive these last year and you'll definitely receive them this year. There's three forms. 1095A will show you the health insurance from the marketplace. A 1095B shows you had health coverage from someplace other than the marketplace, like an employer, or you had Medicare or Medicaid or any other one outside the marketplace. What these forms do is it helps you as a tax preparer find out if they were covered all 12 months for the year, okay? The 1095C, that comes from an employer. It does two things. It helps you realize that they may have had insurance offered and covered from their employer. And if somebody is covered by an employer, they can go to the marketplace if what's on that form 
means that it's greater than 9.56% of their gross income, then they consider it unaffordable through their employer and they can go to the marketplace, okay? And if it means that you as an employee have a family plan, that calculation is only done for the employee, not the family, okay? What I mean by that is if I work for somebody and I make a certain amount, okay, and I have to see if that is, um, if that is uh, gonna be unaffordable for me. The thing about it is if an employer has more than 25 full-time employees, they're mandated to provide you insurance, and they know what 9.56% is, and they go right up to that threshold. Because if they make it unaffordable for you with 25 or more full-time employees, and you don't take it, they pay a penalty, okay? So that's the way that works, all right? Uh, we'll talk about this 1095A when we go through some of the problems. Uh, the 8965 is where we do exemptions. Um, when we look at the software, when you turn in, you mail in a separate form that you give to a client, and that certificate number will be mailed back to them. In order to get their return filed at the time that you do it, you can put in the word pending, and that will be allow the return to be filed. Okay? All right. So, these are all the different things that go on here with it. All right. Premium tax credit. Okay? What that is, if you go through the marketplace and you are above the eligibility for the uh, Medicaid, which is now called Managed Care, and the Essential Plan, which is the $20 a month plan, if you're above that, your income would base you for and through the marketplace for a premium tax credit. You can take it as a lump sum at the end of the year on your tax return, or you can get what's called the Advanced Premium Tax Credit, where that amount is paid to the insurance company that you have selected, and that is reducing your monthly premium that you pay to that insurance company, okay? So that's the advanced premium tax credit. The form 8962 is filed to reconcile that, all right? And we'll see that in the uh, example that I'm gonna do, all right? Okay, so we have all that. Income limits. The healthcare law and the, the help that you get is based on the poverty level, okay? The federal poverty level for your family size. So you can see for 2015, 100% or the poverty level for each family size. Up to 400% of the federal poverty level, that's when the premium tax credits stop. So if I have myself, my wife, and two children, I can get help through the marketplace paying for my premium up until I make $95,400, okay? So it's all based on the poverty level, all right? Okay, we'll talk about the 1095A when we do the problems. Uh, let's see here, that's the advanced. We'll talk about that in the problem. I'm showing you 1095A there. We'll talk about the 8962 in the problem. And, Okay, so those are all the remainders of those. They're just kind of the exercises and things so that you can kind of see all the different problems. All right. Okay. So, what I'm going to do real quickly, okay, is I am going to show you the problems from 15, okay? So, if you want to turn in your workbooks to... Page 194. So in the workbook's 194. All right. And just let me get the problems up here. Okay.
Okay. One second, my software is kind of hanging up here. All right. Well, we're going to do this a different way because it doesn't want to help me with this problem. So, All right. Okay. What we're going to do, it doesn't like Michael and Lori Gray for some reason today. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, Barbara Young that we were just on with the uh, assets and depreciation. Okay. So that being said, right now, we know that from the description of the problem that Barbara and Heather on our ACA worksheet, that's on your tree on your left, once you put somebody in, it generates this form and it puts everybody that's on the tax return, whether it's a taxpayer, spouse, and dependents, it creates the ACA worksheet for them, okay? That being said, we have to take a look and say, did the taxpayer, spouse, or any dependent receive insurance through the marketplace? In this case, no. She had coverage through whatever it may have been. She might have borrowed through a co-op or whatever. It wasn't through the marketplace. Also, if you look at her adjusted gross income of 6,652, she would be eligible for Medicaid. You can get Medicaid through the marketplace. So. She did get her Medicaid through the marketplace, but we still check no, because we're not gonna use the form 8962 that you see up here, okay? I know intuitively it's kind of backwards, but if you get Medicaid 
or the essential plan through the marketplace, you check no on this because we don't want to do the 8962, okay? As far as the items here, if we look at Barbara, we check the first box because basically we have determined that she had insurance all 12 months, okay? She had a 1095B that said that she had a coverage 12 months, all right? As did her daughter, okay? It might be the case too at times that she would be through the marketplace and her daughter being 16 might have Child Health Plus. Another one you get through the marketplace, but you do not check yes. You only check yes if you're getting a premium tax credit through the marketplace, okay? We'll talk about the next two when we do some of the other ones, all right? Okay, so that's kind of the way that first problem works. It says that the entire family um, had health insurance for her. Now, if they did not have health insurance, okay, we would check the last box, and basically that's what the problem 15.1 talks about, is that they did not have health insurance for the entire year, okay? Now, kind of deceptive on this one because they will not have a penalty. So when we go to the ACA worksheet, we can see that they should have had a penalty of $487.50 for the two of them not having insurance. However, the worksheet at the bottom takes into account the fact that they are below the filing threshold for a house, head of household of two. So that means they have no penalty, okay? You can see the calculation of the penalty if they had one, but because they're below the filing threshold, all right? So that's the way that calculates. Now, one caveat we talked about. For the healthcare law, the family is, the tax family is everybody on the tax return. In the marketplace, you count everybody's income on the tax return. In this case, if her daughter worked at Tim Hortons and made $5,000, we would have to enter that here. Even though typically we know that a dependent's income is not on a tax return. But in this case, you put it on there because that's the way that the marketplace works to calculate somebody's premium tax credit, okay? So, say that her daughter was working at Tim Hortons and made $10,000, okay? Now, you can see what happened. Based on that, that pushes them above the filing threshold for a head of household with one dependent, and they would end up paying a penalty of $488, okay? So you can kind of see the way that works, all right? Because their income went up because you had to count the dependent, all right? So that's the way the penalty works for somebody for shared responsibility, okay? Now, we're gonna go back to our ACA worksheet. All right, okay. Next example we're gonna do, did the taxpayer, spouse, or independent receive insurance through the marketplace? We're going to say yes, okay? All right, and we're gonna say that they had it all 12 months in the marketplace. So we'll check the first box, okay? All right, that being said, if you look at my tree on the left, what happened? I have an 8962. This is where I'm going to reconcile my um, income, or, excuse me, my advanced premium tax credit based on my income, okay? Now, here's the 8962. This is where we would put in things that they were going to receive the advanced premium tax credit, okay? Based on this household of two, again, modified AGI, we're gonna add in Heather's $10,000, okay? All right, um, so they actually have to do their tax family's income is 16000 I realize the income on the tax return is only sixty six fifty two, but we do have to add Heather's income that she has from her job, okay? We pick, again, we talked about the federal poverty line. If we're living in Alaska, Hawaii, or any of the other 48 states in the District of Columbia. So we pick that, okay? Now, that being said, their 
poverty line is 105%, okay? So we have that. They're above the Medicaid threshold, so they would be responsible, or they, the government says they should be able to pay $28 a month towards their health insurance, okay? Now, down at the bottom, we're going to do part two. This is where we talk about the premium tax credit and reconciliation, all right? Question number nine says, are you allocating the policy between another taxpayer or were they married during the year? Now, you're never going to have to do part four. Um, the reason being is, is if you end up with that, you're going to send it to me. And the reason for that is um, about two weeks ago, I had an individual that I've been fighting for because he got married, was in the marketplace, got married. His wife had insurance for him through her employer, so he dropped the marketplace. You get to do an alternative calculation when you join two people together. Obviously, he applied based on his income, his tax household, and then now his tax hold is the two of them. Well, we did the alternative calculation, sent the form in. The IRS keeps sending him letters informing him that he is not eligible for his refund because of the incorrect amounts on his uh, 8962. <laughs> as I said, we used the form as we did. We were on the phone, I was transferred four times. The fourth time, I got a IRS ACA specialist level two, okay? So it sounded like I was gonna get my answers as to what the delay was on his refund. After being on hold for about an hour and 10 minutes, and a discussion for about 30 minutes with this ACA specialist level two, I was informed by her that nobody in her office knows how this calculation works. So as a taxpayer, you're required to do it, but nobody at the IRS can grade your paper and say whether it was good or bad. So I just sent off 40 pages and showed them how the publication and the instructions for the form work to calculate this. So that they would release this gentleman's refund okay so moral of the story is first question has a red box says yes and the first word is skip that's what I want you to do skip okay we're gonna go to line 10 line 10 is going to ask us how does our 1095 a work does it have all 12 months so if you look at the 1095A, for example, on page 199 in your workbook, it shows that they had insurance through the marketplace for all 12 months. If that's the case, we'll check yes. And we're gonna use the amounts that are on that 1095A. So we go to part three of it, we go to line 33, we have 8439 for column A. And the reason I know that's where it goes in column A is if you look here, it says form 1095A. Form 1095, line 33B is 7080.36, okay? C, D, and E are calculated by the software. 1095A, 33C, I'm gonna use the amount there, 5100, okay? So those amounts are in there. Based on using that, if we go to the bottom, we can see that they received $5,100. Their credit should have been $6,745, so they get the difference on their tax return. So they get $1,645 credit on their tax return. Okay, so that would be added to their refund. All right, if it's the case that they did not, or they got too much, then you would see that they would have to pay it back in the section at the bottom. All right, okay, so that's the way the 8962 works. Now, if it were the case that answered question nine, no, I have the example like the 1095A on page 203 in your workbook, where they just had it, the months of January through October. They decided to drop the insurance. So I would check that I'm gonna use 
12 through 13. You see that my it's up red where it needs information from me. I'm going to get rid of the information that I put in the line 11 because I can't be redundant. And then I'm going to go down here and we'll use the 1095A on page 203. And we'll put in 703. We'll put 590. And the 280. Okay. Now, whoops, let's get back here. Okay. So I put that all in there. Obviously, I would do it all the way down, okay, until October. So yes, you do have to type in each square. There is not a copy and paste. It's not Windows friendly and tax wise, okay? But you can see on here, based on what they should have been allowed, what they received, they're gonna get $282 as a premium tax credit, okay? So that's the way the 8962 works. Now, if they owed money back and they were they owed premium tax credit back and they were below 400%, it would be capped. They wouldn't have to pay it all back. However, what I see a lot when I do tax returns and help people with this is they will sign up for the health care, they kind of predict their income based on their W-2, they get their premium tax credit. But then during the year, they decide that they want to take $10,000 out of money from an IRA, okay? And that adds to their income, and now their premium tax credit is off, and all of a sudden they have to pay it back, okay? And it puts them over 400%, okay, of the poverty level. That means they would pay back their entire premium tax credit they received through the year. And I have seen instances where that has been five, six thousand dollars balance due on their tax return. So that's where the health care law has become such a big part of your tax return. Okay? Now, we're going to leave it as is. We're going to go back to our ACA worksheet. And we're going to go down. Yes, they're in the marketplace. But we're going to use kind of the example that is in 1095 that says, hey, Mom and dad are the two people, in this case, Barbara and Heather, had insurance for uh, 10 months and did not have it for two months. So actually, they would be responsible for a penalty. But if we were going to make them pay the penalty, we would check the box at the bottom and then check November and December for a penalty. But being the good tax preparers that we are, we're going to say, they're going to file for an exemption, okay? So we're going to see if we can get an exemption for them and use the form 8965. Once that's done, I still leave myself checked on the first box. What I mean by that is that the first box says, I have accounted for all 12 months of what they have for health insurance. The first 10 were through the marketplace. The last two are an exemption, okay? So all 12 months are going to keep them from paying the penalty. Once I have that, I'm going to go to my 8965, and I'm going to take a look at my problem here, okay? Uh, let me put one thing in here. Hold on one second. Okay. Jim, Jim can I yes. ask a question? The 8962. Um, because I was kind of following along with the Michael Gray thing. Do you have to select that? Do you have to add that form? Because the 8965, you generate that by checking that one box, yes, that you want to apply for an exemption, right? But the 8962, do you have to just um, pull that out of the add form display? No, actually, when you do the ACA worksheet, if you check yes on the first line, that they're okay. through the marketplace, Oh, okay. 8962 will be generated oh, on the okay. tree. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. No, thanks. that's all right. All right. So, 8965, health coverage exemptions, okay? This is where we talked about them in the text. Marketplace granted. That means I am filing one of my forms, a hardship form, or I'm declaring that, you know, I'm a member of certain religious sect or I, whatever it may be, that I just don't think it's affordable for the upcoming year. That's where you'd file that. You put the name of the individual in, their social security number, and again, this is where 
Odd enough, the word pending fits perfectly, okay? So certificate number is going to be the same number as the number of letters in the word pending, okay? So you would put that in so that they could file their return, all right? That's if you're doing something with your filing a separate form. You are not responsible for doing that exemption form. That is up to them, okay? They will need to send that in. You will just have to inform them if you do not send that form in and you do not receive that certificate number later in the mail for mailing that form in, it goes in separately, it goes to a place in Kentucky, um, they'll get a letter from the IRS that says they owe the money back, okay? The next one is an exemption because of the filing threshold, okay? Remember we determined that if it was not for Heathers, they would not have to worry about the penalty. But in this case, they do have to worry about the penalty because adding Heather's income puts them over the filing threshold for head of household with one dependent, okay? So, are you claiming a hardship? No, because we do not qualify, okay? What we are going to do is we're gonna use part three. We're gonna use an exemption based on that workbook uh, in the, the text. You know, it had the codes and the letters, okay? So, I will put in, we're only gonna have to do oops, Barbara, because Heather is through Child Health Plus. All right, so she's fine. Uh, we put in Barbara's uh, social security number. I'm just gonna make one up here, okay? Her exemption code. All right, we can hit F1 here. If I do that, brings up my little help menu. Down at the bottom of the very bottom of this help menu, Here's a list of exemption codes. And this probably looks very familiar from what's in the textbook. What we're gonna use, they had a two month gap because they didn't have insurance for the last two months of the year. We can put, because it was less than three consecutive months, a code B, okay? So we come back to our 89.65, we put the B in, we check off that we're getting an exemption for those two months that they did not have insurance. Okay, so that's the way the healthcare, as far as the exemption form works. All right, so that is everything in there. Okay, all right, okay, so how exciting is that? I'm gonna unmute and see if anybody else has any questions. Any other questions on the healthcare? Can you explain again why she got a code B? Uh, because she had uh, three or less months of no insurance. Okay. What I mean by that is, that, you know, by right, she, we're going to say that she purposely dropped it because she couldn't find it affordable. So we're going to look for an exemption to help her out. The one that we chose to do was the two months. Okay. Um, that was the simplest one to use. If she had where she dropped it for the last four months, we might choose a different code because we might pursue the unaffordable based on her income. Okay. okay? But that one she met because she had three or less months of no insurance. Okay, thank you. And like I said, when you're doing and you're working in the offices, you'll probably have me on speed dial because I am the one that resolves all these healthcare problems, okay? Um, just as I informed you, both the IRS and the state of New York have no idea what's going on with this. And there's half the time that when I talk to somebody, I'm teaching them how it works because nobody understands it, okay? I talked earlier about the premium tax credit that some people like to just wait and get it as a lump sum on their tax return at the end of the year. The funniest part about this is that makes no sense to the IRS. Why wouldn't you take the money throughout the year? Because I've had two people that haven't got their refunds because the IRS can't figure out why their refund was so big when they just waited and got the whole credit at the end of the year. So the IRS keeps holding their refund. We keep telling them he did not take it on a monthly basis. He wanted it the whole sum on his tax return. Well, that makes no sense. Why would you do that? Obviously, there's a disconnect there. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, any other questions on healthcare? I know it's confusing. Um, 
with our new administration, things are probably going to disappear. Uh, the penalty, I have a feeling 2016 will be the last year we have to do the penalty. Um, as far as the mandate for having insurance, um, I think that will go away. Um, I think what's going to happen is for those that don't want to buy health insurance, um, they will be able to self-fund, if you will, and they will have an expansion of the health savings accounts. So somebody can use a health savings account, and based on their income, they may get assistance in funding that so that they can be self-pay without having health insurance. So that, that's the way everything reads right now. That's probably going to be part of the uh, repeal or replace that they talk about. Kim, yes, Liz. Kim. Um, that thing that you were talking about was pending. I, I never ran in, into that. If somebody comes yes. in yes. and they don't have insurance and they're just going, rah, 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 you know, they didn't bother, you know, and they didn't care kind of thing. But now they care because they see, you know, at least today that they're going to get charged with a penalty. Um, who do they call to get that pending thing, to get that number? Do we have a number that we have them call? or No. Like I said, the form, hold on one second here, give me just a second. Yeah, it's, I saw where you typed in pending, but, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I mean here. Okay, okay good deal. I'll watch. All right, let me see if they're still higher. Yeah, you see, yeah, it's just, it's confusing. It really is when you get, you know, if somebody answers that question, no, you go, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Trust me, I know. No. What do you mean, no? <laughs> well, you should it to Nancy Pelosi. It, well, it's, it's that case, you know, you have to, just as you said, Liz, a little bit of it, it's playing by ear. If you have somebody sitting across from you and, and, and myself being a navigator, I want to help everybody I can with this just to help them get this done but when you get that person that is just belligerent that they're just anti um you know anti government or anti health care law or government or whatever and they said i'm just going to be the one that doesn't do it well you got to kind of you know decide where you want to pursue are you going to let them beat you up or you know, you kind of have to follow their lead because if there's somebody that just says, I can't afford it, this is my income, you know, I help my son pay for his mortgage, you know, whatever it may be. But you got somebody that's just kind of being that person, um, you, you know, you yeah, I think the only one we ran into last year with the volunteers last like that was somebody that worked for a living and just with what they made at a factory at Jamestown, they just couldn't afford yeah. the you know or they didn't feel like they could afford their health care through their employer so it was you know so bad when their refund was smaller but yeah well you got to remember you know new york and minnesota with the being the only two states that have the essential plan which is the twenty dollars a month if you're oh, yeah. a family of four and you make forty eight thousand five hundred dollars or less you can get insurance for twenty dollars a person what? per month yeah. no deductible and your biggest copay would be if you're in the hospital, you'd have to pay $150 copay for your admission to a hospital. So obviously, there are probably a lot of people that are listening that would like that. All right. Here is the, the, what you were talking about, Liz, and this is what this, uh, with that on there. Um, this is the hardship exemption form uh, for shared responsibility. You complete this form on a separate basis, and you're going to mail it in. Okay. Um, these are the categories, like I talked about, homeless, evicted, um, shutoff notice, you received the shutoff notice. So if you don't want to have to, you know, Liz, tell them, I mean, this is kind of tongue in cheek, but that person that's giving you a hard time say, hey, just don't pay your electric bill for a couple months, get a shutoff notice, and you have to worry about it, okay? Obviously, you don't want to do that, but they could do that. 
But here's all the different things that go through. Again, 14, you experienced hardship. It kept you from getting health insurance that's not listed. And you just have to create all the information. Once you submit this form, Liz, it goes into right. Kentucky and you finish this out, they will send you the certificate number. Okay? So as it says down here at the end, you mail this to London, Kentucky for healthcare insurance marketplace exemption processing. Then they will send you a document in about one to two weeks, it says, that will give you the um, your certificate number. All right? Okay. So it's something they can download on the net. They exactly. just go to that healthcare then, insurance marketplace, right? Yep. Okay. Then what happens is, you know, the IRS accepts e files with the word pending. Okay. And later on, this uh, EACN number comes to the taxpayer and it also catches up at the IRS. They join them and then they're fine. It's not like you have to amend the return and put it in. Okay. You will just catch up with each other that you have this. All right. So that's the way that form works, okay? Thank you. Okay, I have a Thank question. You. Sure. You said that if she, if the employer is offering an insurance policy and they go through the marketplace, they don't, they cannot, they can only go unassisted without any, they can't hit that managed care. Well, it, Exactly. If your employer offers insurance and it is not greater than 9.56% your income, then you have to take the employer plan. Okay? Even though you might be able to get it cheaper in the marketplace, that's one of the ways that works with the employer plans. Okay? okay. Only if it's going to be greater than 9.56% of your gross income, not your taxable, but your gross, Okay. The marketplace. And that's only based on a single, right? Yeah, only based employee. on one employee, if, you know, the single employee and a single plan. It's not based on anything that has to do with family. Okay. Okay. All right. We've got that form, Liz, okay? Yes, thank you. All right. Good to know. Um, those forms for all the different things, uh, the ones for Indians and religious sects and stuff like that. I create a folder for healthcare and put it on everybody's desktop in their offices, and then you just have to pop it open and print it out. Okay? Wow. All right. Okay. All right, I'm going to mute everybody, and we're going to talk about one last little thing here. Okay? Um, chapter 16. Okay, hold on one second here. Okay, chapter 16 is kind of our catch-all, okay? Um, it has our alternative minimum tax, the kitty tax, um, Social Security, Medicare tax, household employment, all the different things. I'm just going to talk briefly about these. I'm going to let you read those. Um, alternative minimum tax, um, we could spend two hours teaching you all 64 lines of the alternative minimum tax form. It's like its own tax return, okay? Uh, higher income, it's based on that, where that, you know, based on somebody's level of income, if it's very high, they pay a tax that's based on a calculation of that, okay? Kitty tax, you do run into this one, especially if you have somebody that uh, is a college student or has college students, and they were bought savings bonds when they were born or when they graduated, and they're going to be cashing those uh, to pay for college, or they receive money that's unearned income, like interest on bonds. If that income is greater than $2,100, they will be subject to the kitty tax. What that is, is if you have greater than $2,100 of unearned income as a dependent or a child, you end up having that taxed at your parents' tax rate, okay? You can read about it in the chapter. Um, the kitty tax, the other option is the parents can put it on theirs, then obviously it's going to be taxed at the higher rate, okay? So this is where when somebody goes to cash bonds or whatever it may be, 
you know, we have to really take a close look at it and see whose social security number is it in. So who's going to be accountable for the interest? If it's the child, we have to look at it because it may be taxed at a higher rate. Okay. Uh, unreported social security, Medicare and additional Medicare tax. Just remember from when we did W-2s, if you have a single W-2 and you have excess social security or Medicare or unreported, you know, those are things that you have to take up with your employer for a single W-2 person. If you have two W-2s and it adds to it together, you reclaim that or talk about that on your tax return, okay? All right. Next one is the first time home buyer's credit, okay? This quite possibly could be the silliest credit that was ever created, okay? Bad idea all the way around. Might, might uh, rank right up there with the healthcare law in the 982 pages. There's a window of about eight months to a year where people took this credit on their tax return and now are required to buy, pay it back. I do have a client that has a neighbor. They're paying the credit back. They have a neighbor that bought their house and closed a month later. They did not have to pay it back. So there's just an odd little window of people that are paying this back. Basically, it was about five to eight thousand dollar credit for first time home buyers, and a married filing joint typically has to pay back about five hundred dollars a year. The IRS is really going after this the last couple years. E-filed returns have been rejected if you forget to put this on because it says that they are due to make their credit payment. You forgot to put it on the return. Okay, so it's kind of a little credit to put on there. All right. Tax withholding and estimated taxes, all right? Um, if somebody is a self-employed individual, um, their income does not have withholding and does not have Social Security and uh, Medicare or what is self-employment tax taken out. You will do estimated taxes. Basically what that is is throughout the year, quarterly, every three months, you're gonna pay a little bit of your tax so that the IRS does not penalize you for not paying your tax timely. Uh, a lot of times right now, we're dealing with letters from 2013 for New York State where they're sending out penalty letters for individuals that had excess balances due um, from self-employment or tax in 2013 saying that you did not pay your tax timely, here's a penalty. Yes, from 2013, not just 15, 13, okay? Basically what you have to do is if you have a large balance due and you have several years of that, you need to make sure that you pay quarterly estimated so that they don't penalize you. The government, federal government, and New York State want their money timely, okay? Tax withholding, obviously this is when we fill out for a form or W-2 employee. Um, we fill out our W-4 and an IT-2104 for the state and we do our withholding. When you talk to somebody about their withholding, they have to realize the greater the withholding, the greater the refund, okay? The smaller the withholding, the smaller the refund, all right? Okay, basically you have to decide, do you want your tax refund in your paycheck or do you want it at the end of the year in your refund, okay? Now, somebody that chooses to go exempt on their withholding and chooses to do this quite often, Sometimes every year they end up with a balance due. And if they fail to pay that balance due, after three years, the IRS will send a letter to their employer mandating maximum withholding, okay? I see this letter quite often from people that have gone exempt, don't wanna pay taxes out of their paycheck, like the big paycheck. Then at the end of the year, they have this balance due and they can't pay it because they haven't saved for it. And then after a few years, the IRS says, enough's enough, we're gonna make you do withholding and the maximum amount and the employer is required to take the money out of their paycheck on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however they're paid basis and that money is paid down. They have no choice and they cannot change it back to whatever they want for five years, okay? So that's basically withholding. You can kind of read through all these in 16 um, and talk about different ones on there, okay? Now, one last thing that I'm going to do is we're going to talk just a little bit about New York. 
Okay. So I am going to go back to our friend Barbara. And I'm going to talk about a few things on the New York side. Okay. On the New York return, you can see that first section is all basically a condensed version of our federal tax return. Okay. Second section, we have additions. Um, you know, if there's bonds that we had that were not obligations to pay tax on the federal, we have to add them on the state. We would do that on our Schedule B on our federal. Uh, we've talked about the 414H, or I've talked about it in some of the other video clips, okay? And 529s, there's a little worksheet there that you use for those, okay? Subtractions, uh, we realize on this, we don't have to pay tax on our refund that we claimed on the federal. If you have a pension from New York State, local, and federal government, all of it is tax-free in New York, as is all of the taxable Social Security in New York, as is interest income on U.S. bonds, and if you've reached 59 and a half, you get to exclude the first $20,000 of pension and annuity income or IRA income, okay? And you have to prorate that if you turn 59 and a half during the year, okay? So if I turn 59 and a half halfway through the year, I'm only gonna get to exclude the first 10,000, okay? So that's where you would have that income, all right? Standard deduction, um, we have the one here where we have the forms, okay? You can take a look if you go in here and hit F9, you can take a look at what's basically the New York version of the Schedule A, and it is, you know, in this case it's blank because we did not do any itemizing for Barbara, but on this case, if you were itemizing on the federal, it might show it here and compare the itemized against the standard deduction, okay? That being said, if you notice, the standard deduction for head households is much larger, but you only get exemptions for dependents, okay? So a higher standard deduction, but less exemptions, all right? In this case, she has no taxable income. You can see here, if somebody has low income to help pay their tax bill, they get what's called the New York State Household Credit. Basically, that is our governor saying, thank you for living, breathing in our state, and I apologize that you have so little income. Here's some help, okay? So that's what that credit is, all right? Obviously, we don't have anything with New York City or Yonkers we have to worry about there, okay? At the bottom here, if you are a charitable individual and you would like to give to any of these funds, you know, if you want to see the Olympics come to New York, or if you uh, have a stigma about mentally ill individuals, I mean, you know, some of them seem kind of odd, but, you know, obviously there's some very good causes here. You can give um, contributions there that they would uh, take out of your refund, okay? Child tax credit, family relief credit. Um, if everybody remembers, anybody that had a household that made more than $40,000, um, that uh, there was a $350 check mailed out. That was the family tax relief credit. Um, oddly enough, that was done in August, September, October of the year of the election of our governor. And then once we got the election done, they seemed to stop. And the checks were really only sent upstate. They stopped them downstate. Um, you know, some people surmised that it was the governor trying to help his election cause. Um, the legislature for our state said, enough's enough. Everybody should get this. So now it's on the tax return based on your income and if you have a dependent under the age of 17, okay? Dependent care, earned income credit, we see those come over from the federal. Non-custodial parent, this is a credit for those individuals that are the non-custodial parent and have low income. So the kids are not on their return as custodial, they can get an earned income credit. You are only eligible for this if you are a low income individual and you are current on your child support. If you are not current on your child support, you will not get this credit. Equally, um, we do have individuals that are not current on their child support. They file, they fail to file tax returns because they know their refund is going to be taken. Uh, two years ago, New York State started confiscating vehicles for those individuals that were behind on child support. 
Uh, what this resulted in was several, and I had one year I could not understand why it was happening, but I finally figured it out with why they were doing this. Um, individuals that were independent contractors or roofers were coming in in March when their employment season was getting ready to go, filing two, three, four years worth of returns because their car had been confiscated and they couldn't get to work because they were behind on their child support, didn't file returns because they didn't want the refunds to go to that child support. And now, being that their car was impounded and they couldn't get to work, they had to file, okay? Uh, real property tax credit, that's the renter's credit. Um, college tuition credit, that is the one that is the complement to the um, education credit. If you take a look at the form on New York, it is the 272. You're going to fill it out. Um, the information will come over. 8863 is our education credit on the federal. We have the student's name. It is only for undergraduate. Um, and then on this one, you can put in with no limit on the amount of tuition. Remember on the federal, we can put a maximum of $4,000 in for the education credit. On this one, say that we're going to Canisius. It's roughly about 10,000 a semester or 20,000 a year. So Canisius College, we could put $20,000 in this field. If that's the case, if we go to page two of this form, there's a little section on line eight that says, am I gonna take this as an itemized, which $20,000 added to our itemized is probably gonna help, or am I gonna take it as the education credit? So on this, we can toggle back and forth, and it'll show which one's the best deal for us, okay? So we have that one for the education credit. Um, some of these are New York City. A Couple other quick ones that I wanna show you that you will run into. Uh, I'm gonna go to add a form. Uh, the other one that we do quite often is the New York Firefighters and Ambulance Workers Credit. It is a $200 credit for volunteer firemen, okay? And they know it, so they'll come in with their information and if it's the taxpayer and the spouse, they both get it, maximum of 400. The other thing is for volunteer firemen, you'll wanna ask them if their fire hall uses the software to track their response to calls. What I mean by that is a lot of volunteer firemen, when they respond to a call, they check in, they uh, then have software that records the miles to the call and back, and then they can bring that sheet in as a summary, and you can put that on their volunteer miles, okay? So that's another one that's there. The one other credit that I just wanna to touch on quickly that is a little known credit in New York, okay? is the nursing home credit, okay? This is what's called the bed tax. Um, if you've ever stayed in a hotel, you see all those taxes at the bottom of your hotel, it's basically what they call a bed tax for staying. Nursing homes in New York, if it is a nursing home that charges this tax because they have to pay it to New York State, um, and you're a payer there, you'll see it on a monthly statement for somebody in a nursing home. You can get that credit back if you're paying it on your bill. I have seen this credit be four, five, even six thousand dollars for some people that have uh, that are paying for somebody in a nursing home. Uh, it's a great credit. Uh, we put it in. About two months later, they'll get a letter from the IRS, or excuse me, from New York State, saying please support, provide uh, documentation and support. Um, that documentation is the copies of those monthly bills, and then they get their refund. Okay. So another very good credit that's there on New York. All right. Um, and those are some of the things I wanted to touch on about New York. Okay. Uh, you have a New York State consideration that's on there, so you can uh, see all those that are on there too. Okay. All right. I'm going to unmute everybody, so mute yourself if you need to. And is there any questions? Hi, this is Elaine. I have two questions. Um, one is on some of the problems that we've been given. Um, at the beginning information, it'll say that they received a state refund, and I think sometimes an Empire State Child Credit mm -hmm. of some amount. Where do, I'm a little confused. Where does that go when we get into the computer part of putting this stuff in? Okay, great question. The way you handle that is if I get a refund, okay, and I have that refund amount, 
I do not have to claim that refund if my Empire Child's tax credit is greater than that. Okay? Um, it's just something you know that you calculate. There's not really per se a spot or a worksheet or a form or anything that does that. Um, it's kind of a bad deal in New York because you used to get the little postcards that said 1099G that said you need to report this amount on your federal return as a taxable refund. They don't do that anymore. Okay? Now, you have to kind of do it on your own. So basically a way to think about it is you take a look at your refund. You look at that page that we just discussed on page four of your um, the New York return. And if that credit is greater or eats up that refund, I do not have to claim it. If that refund, is, or excuse me, that credit is less than my refund, then I just subtract it and put the balance or the remaining amount on line 10 of the 1040. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is, can you talk a little bit about uh, the process for uh, becoming an EG tax employee? Um, from the time you get the, our little form back to the time we might actually be working? I'd love just like an idea of what that looks like. Yeah, uh, what happens is, you know, obviously you create the form so that we give you plenty of options. Um, I know I've had several people ask about uh, the hours, part-time, different things like that. Um, really, you can work as many hours as you want. Um, some of it is office dependent, um, you know, different things like that. Um, and if you have the option that you want to bounce around if there's more than one office in your area. Um, I had an individual that did the class with me last year. Uh, while I was running the office in Lockport last year, the, um, this individual ended up working four other offices before he bounced back to me because each one has different peaks. Um, what happens is starting about January 13th, 14th, you'll start to go into the office. Uh, you'll do a lot more training with the electronic filing, all the processing of all the returns, um, how to handle things as far as what happens in the office and the procedures. You know, we'll, we'll talk about things about uh, how to process taking things out of the refund uh, for payment or whatever it may be. Um, what happens is once I have that form back, you go on a list and in the next week or two, um, they'll set up an interview time for you. Uh, you'll come in, they'll interview, talk to you about which offices, talk to you about the options, um, and then present uh, what you would do in each one of those. Um, the way the wages are worked, you're paid an hourly rate, and then you're paid bonus structure based on the volume of the office, the volume of your returns. Um, so per return, you get a bonus and you get part of that fee. So, you know, but like I said, you can work as much as little as you want. I had individuals that worked for me. Um, one lady was, uh, she's a full-time corrections officer. Um, she would come in and work every night and then every other Saturday for me. And it was a nice little bonus for her, um, for income and, and supplemental income. Um, the season basically runs through about the third week of January through tax season. Um, like I said, Depending on the office and depending on your availability, you can work as much or as little as you want um, moving it around. Um, I have a, another gentleman. He's uh, retired. He's a grandpa. He goes down, and his other job is he drives for Amagon Funeral Home. Okay? He always, he always laughs with me. He says, you know, when I come to EG Tax, my, comp my uh, clients complain. When I'm doing my other job, they never say a word. Okay? So, <laughs> all right. So that's kind of his perspective. But, again. He works in as much and as little as he'd like, um, and it, you know, he can work at however he wants. Um, you're never going to be in an office by yourself. Um, you know, there's always going to be somebody there. Um, you always have a support system. Um, it's not like we throw you to the wolves once you're in the office. You're going to do 20 more problems in office with somebody there. Um, your first few returns will be just like I do my office. Um, I'll pick clients knowing that they're coming in and what the returns are, and I will say to them, hey, you know, Elaine's a new um, preparer. I'd like her to get some experience. Can she do your return? I will be here uh, working with her, but I'd like her to do your return, and most of them will say, yeah. So, okay. Does that get everything covered? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, they uh, Maria does all the interviews on that. Uh, she's the district manager. Um, she's just trying to get uh, – that's why I sent out the email. Uh, we're trying to get everything in line because um, – 
you know, we have 27 offices. Uh, some of them are franchises to pass along the information, get people in, get them interviewed, get everything in order with, with stuff like that. Because like I said, once uh, we get past Christmas, it's fast and furious. Uh, we start doing in-office training about mid-January. I think my concern is um, that letter said we've asked you to master a lot of information. And um, I don't know that anybody could master all of this from taking this course because it is so much information. Uh, and I'm just concerned, um, how do you evaluate if someone's really ready for this? Um, I haven't mastered it all. Uh, I know one individual that uh, has probably mastered 98% of it, and that's Esther. Um, you know, I feel good because I'm the one that's knowledgeable on healthcare, so she still asks me questions on that. Um, but again, you know, you have a support system and resources. There's things that, uh, you know, with different returns and different stuff like that, you're going to have resources, that whether it be in your office or another office or myself or Maria or Chris or Esther, that you can reach out. And they do it constantly. We do it constantly with each other. Um, I used to have a gentleman that worked 30 years for the IRS. Um, he was actually in their collections department, so his expertise was different. He and I would always go back and forth. Hey, can you look at this to make sure I've done this correctly? You know, because you don't master it all. There's just too much. When you think about the tax code and the tens of thousands of pages, there's no way. Um, as far as what you need to know starting out, basically it's a tax-wise software. And it's getting a W-2 in and then understanding what information you need to collect. As far as mastering it, as far as the knowledge and stuff, you're always going to have resources. Okay, thank you. Tim, I, I think my, this is Liz, I, I think my biggest concern, and, and I'm sure it, it's kind of the unspoken one, is Maria and the in-house training thing. Are you talking about us eventually having to come to Buffalo? No, actually this year because of the Zoom, what we're going to do is everybody will kind of be in their um, office and, okay. uh, you know, we set up the offices. I, I helped do it, uh, Georgia IT gentlemen, um, everybody, right. and, and the offices pretty much have their same workflow or procedures. Uh, right, so like the office, we, would end up, we would end up going into like Schultz, for instance, and the computers would already be there kind of thing. Exactly. And then we kind of do a presentation and you kind of look around and say, oh, yeah, I see that. Or, you know, just like we're doing here and you can ask questions and say, hey, where do I find this? And that way yeah. you don't have to make that trip. We're not going to bring everybody to, you know, the. Um, yeah, I think that would be helpful, you know, to have a couple people in the room, you know, so we were actually kind of sitting there helping each other because that's, I always use that phone a friend thing that's just, it's just good to have uh, people sitting right there with you. And, um, you know, what, one resource that I know I use a lot is um, just IRS.gov. Mm -hmm. I was on there yesterday and, and I know you do too, I'm sure. Um, and you could actually save publication 17 to your favorite so oh, yeah. all you gotta do is scroll down through it i mean that's the thing with taxes is they're an open book test and you know yeah I, well I and everything is that way I, um, I did them for a long time so the other thing um, is uh quick finders there's one yep. of these in everybody's office yeah that's a good book yep this is not the tabs um basically it's a tax law and it's just a quick summary of it um, and it's set up in order just like we do the textbook by the tax return um, yes. and you do it all the time. Um, you know, I'll call the clients and say, hey, just want to read this to you. This is the way this is stated uh, by the IRS so that they know that, you know, I'm looking for it. Also, it helps me verify my thought process, but it also reassures the client to say, hey, he knows where to find the answers. Right, you could show it to him in black or white. Exactly, exactly. Well, right. there's, there's a lot of gray in the, in the tax law, but that, <laughs> <laughs> Black and white is what it's bringing in, so. Nothing's 100% sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, interpretation, I guess. But, uh, yes, you can show it to them printed black and white. Yeah. Um, Tim, I, I don't know that I would want to do this, but I just wanted to ask, like, for the last few years since I retired, I've been volunteering with the United Way um, doing taxes. Um, would we still be able to do something like that, or would that be considered a conflict? No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, obviously, we're trying to grow our business. 
um, you know, yeah. we, we'd like those people to come in and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I think the, the ones I help with are at the, the um, old, I was going to say old folks home. <laughs> but yeah, the Lutheran, Lutheran services where it's, you know, the folks that live in the, the senior housing there. Yes. You know, those are pretty much the people that, that we were doing their returns for. So, yep. okay. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, own the business. You know, that's the type of thing that we are expanding to different offices. That's why we're trying to break it through with what we're doing with Schultz down in the southern tier and then the offices down there. Um, right, that's a whole different ballgame. You know, yeah. when you're the face of EG Tax and you're doing returns in a situation like that, it's just like when I go out and speak all the time. You know, I do a couple speaking engagements a week at different places. Um, you know, you talk about that. I go to my church. There's a 55 and over group. I speak to, I give them advice on their taxes. They may not come see me, but they might have somebody they say, hey, I don't need them, but this is where you need to go. Right. So. Good. Thank you. All right. Any other Tim? questions? Tim? Yes. When uh, someone was telling me about how um, clients pay, where you have to keep your own bank, does that happen very often? Keep your own bank. Yeah, like if um, someone doesn't have a credit card or a checking account, you have to make change for them? Oh, petty cash. There'll be petty cash in the, the offices. Oh, okay. So you yeah. don't have to use your own money. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. no. The, the way that the returns are paid for, you can do cash, check. Um, if you need change, uh, the supervisor will have petty cash in the office to make change. Um, or the other way that if they don't have a method to pay that time, they can do the processing where they take the fee out of the refund, um, and then you just process that. But yo, by no means are, are you expected in any, any way, shape, or form to front any money for the, the preparer to um, have them pay for the return. That's all based on EG tax or the supervisor. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, um, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, like I said, I'm hoping to hear today to make sure what's on Friday. Um, I'll probably send something out either later today or tomorrow about uh, a Zoom exam time. Um, and that time, um, I can't get too many different times because like I said, I'm very busy right now uh, setting up other things, uh, many other hats and responsibilities as far as the corporate office uh, getting us up and going for the tax season. But uh, I'm going to try to accommodate everybody to be able to do it so that, again, with the weather the way it is and the length of the drive, I don't want to have to drive into the snow of Jamestown and the Southern Tier. Um, my wife does that when she uh, does her marketing at all the Walmarts down there. And, um, you know, she decided not to go down there yesterday, which sounds like a good idea. So, yeah, we don't uh, have But I will send that information out to everybody, okay? Yes, we're getting buried down here. It's not a good day for a drive to the country. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to have to do that. So, right. I love the snow, but uh, it's more so with my, you know, blanket, the puppy on the lap, and, uh, you know, watching it up through the window. So, all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'm going to put this up so that if you need to review anything, it'll be up on there. All right. We'll Thank talk you. to everybody later.